Hi, everyone. Welcome to theCUBE's coverage of International Women's Day. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. As part of International Women's Day, we're featuring some of the leading women in business technology, from developer to all types of titles and to the executive level. And one topic that's really important is called getting a seat at the table, board makeup, having representation at corporate boards, private and public companies. It's been a big push and uh, former technology operating executive and corporate board member, she's a board machine, Sue Barsamian, mm -hmm. formerly with HPE, and Will Packard. So great to see you. CUBE alumni, distinguished CUBE alumni. Thanks yes, for coming. I'm, I was, I'm, I'm very proud of my CUBE alumni title. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it opens a lot of doors for you. Um, we're we're hyped, psyched to have you on. This is a really important topic and I want to get into the, the whole, as women advance up and they're sitting on the boards, they can implement policy and they, there's governance, obviously public yeah. companies have very strict uh, oversight and not strict, but like formal. Private yeah. boards have to operate, be nimble, they don't have to share all their results, but still boards play an important role in the success of scaled up companies. So super important that representation there is key. I want to yes. get, I want to get into that. But first, before we get started, how did you get into tech? How did it all start for you? Yeah, long time ago, um, I was uh, an electrical engineering major, uh, came out in 1981, um, when, you know, opportunities for engineering, if you were, I, I went to Kansas State as an undergrad, um, and basically in those days, you went to Texas and did semiconductors, you went to Atlanta and did communication satellites, uh, you went to Boston or you went to Silicon Valley. And um, for me, that wasn't too hard a choice. Uh, I ended up going West and um, really, I guess, what I embarked on a 40 year career in Silicon Valley um, and absolutely loved it. Uh, largely software, but sometime on the hardware side. I started out in networking, but largely software. And then, um, you know, four years ago, transitioned to my next chapter which is the corporate board director. And again, focused on, on technology, software, and cybersecurity boards. For the folks watching, we'll cut through another segment we could probably do about your operating career, but you rose to the ranks, became a um, senior operating executive at the biggest companies in the world, you look back at Enterprise, uh, and you look back at you look at Enterprise and others. Very great career, okay? And so now mm -hmm. you're kind of like, put that on pause and you're moving on to the next chapter, which is being a board director. What inspired you to be a board director for multiple public companies and multiple private companies? Well, how many companies are you on? But what's the inspiration? <laughs> what's the inspiration? First, tell me how many board sh ships you're on, board direct seats you're on, and then um, what inspired you to become a board director? Yeah, um, so I'm I'm on three public, uh, and you are limited in terms of the number of publics that you can do uh, to four. So I'm on three public, and I'm on uh, four private from a tech perspective. Uh, and those range from, uh, you know, a $4 billion in revenue public company down to a 35 person private company. So I've got the whole range. So you're like uh, freelancing. I mean, what is it like? It's a full-time job, obviously. There's a lot of work involved. Yeah, yeah. it's- um, Why are you doing it? Yeah, um, well, you know, so I, I retired from being an operating executive after 37 years. And, um, but I loved, uh, I mean, it's tough, right? It's tough these days, particularly with all the pressures out there in the market, not to mention the pandemic, et cetera. But, um, but I loved it. I, I loved working. I loved having a career. Um, and I was ready to back off on, I would say the stresses of quarterly results and the stresses of international travel, you know, so much of it. Um, but I wasn't ready to back off from being involved and engaged and continuing to learn new things. Uh, I think that's why you come to tech. And for me, why why I went to the Valley to begin with um, was really that energy and that excitement. And it's like, it's constantly reinventing itself. And I, I felt like that wasn't over for me. Um, and um, I thought, because I hadn't done boards uh, before I retired from operating roles, um, I thought, you know, that would fill the bill. And it's honestly, it has exceeded expectations. In a good way, you feel good about where you're at and yeah. what you went in. What was the expectation going in and what surprised you? And were there people along the way that kind of gave you some 
pointers or yeah, don't do this, stay away from this. Take us through yeah. some experiences. Yeah, honestly, um, there is an amazing network of technology board directors, um, you know, in the U.S. and specifically in the Valley. Um, and we are all incredibly supportive. We have groups um, where we get together as board directors and we talk about topics and we share best practices and stories. And so um, I underestimated that, right? I thought I was going to, um, I thought I was going to enter this chapter where I would be largely giving back after 37 years. You've learned a little bit, right? Um, what I underestimated was um, just the power of continuing to learn and being surrounded by so many amazing people. When you know, when you do, you know, multiple boards, your learnings are just multiplied, right? Because you see not just one model, but you see many models. You see not just one problem, but many problems. Not just one opportunity, but many opportunities. And um, I underestimated how. Um, how great that would be for me from a learning perspective. And then your ability to share from one board to the other board, uh, because all of my boards are companies who are also quite close to each other. The executives collaborate. So that has turned out to be really um, exciting for me. Um, so you, you had the stressful job, you rose to the top of the ranks, quarterly shot clock earnings, hard, and it's hard charging. It's like, it's like you know, being an athlete, as we say, tech athlete, you're a tech athlete. Now you're taking that to the next level, which is now you're juggling multiple operational kind of things, but not with the super pressure, but there's still a lot of responsibility. I noticed one board, you've got compensation committee. I mean, there's work involved. It's not like you're, yeah, no, you're clipping it's, coupons and having pizza. Yeah, you know? it's, no, it's real work. It's, believe me, it's real work. But um, I don't know how long it took me to not to stop waking up and looking at my phone and thinking somebody was going to be dropping their forecast, right? Just that pressure of the number. And as a board member, obviously you are there to support and help guide the company and you feel, you know, you feel the pressure and the responsibility um, of what that role entails, but it's, it's, it's not the same um, as the frontline pressure every quarter, it's it's different. And so I I did I did the first type, I loved it. You know, I'm loving the second type. You know, the, the retirement it's always a cliche these days, but it's, it's not really like what people think it is. It's not like getting a boat, going fishing, or whatever. It's doing whatever you want to do. That's what retirement is. And yeah. you've chose to stay active. Um, your brain's being tested, and you're working it, having fun, without yeah. all the stress. But it's 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 enough. It's like going to the gym. It's you're not hardcore workout, but you're working out uh, with with the brain. With, with the brain. Yeah, uh, no, for sure. It's it's um, it is. It's just a different. It's just a different model. Um, but the you know the level of conversations, the level of decisions, um, all of that is um, is quite high. Which again, I like. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah and just, you really can't talk about some of the fun questions I want to ask, like, uh, what's the valuations like? How's the market? Is there headwinds? Is there tailwinds? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's an amazing, it's an amazing market right now. With, as you know, counter indicators everywhere. Right, something's up, something's down. You know, consumer spending's up, therefore interest rates go up, and you know, employment's down, and. So uh, our, uh, our unemployment's down, and so it's 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 hard. Um, actually, I really empathize with um, you know the and and have a great deal of respect for the CEOs and leadership teams of my board companies because uh, you know I I kind of retired from operating role, and then everybody else had to deal with running a company during a pandemic, and then running a company through the great resignation and then running a company through a downturn. Um, you know, those are all tough things. And um, I, I have a ton of respect for any operating executive who's navigating through this and leading a company right now. Uh, I'd love to get your take on the board conversations at the end, if we have more time, what the mood is. But I want to ask you about one more thing real quick before we go to the next topic is, you're a retired ex uh, operating executive and you're on multiple boards, so you get your hands full. I noticed there's a lot of amazing leaders to other female tech athletes joining boards, but they also have full-time jobs. 
Um, yeah. And so what's your advice? Because I know there's a lot of networking, a lot of sharing going on. There's kind of a balance between how much you can contribute on the board versus doing the day job, but, but there's real need for more women on board. So yet there's a yeah. lot going on boards. What's the current state of the union, if you will, state of the market relative to people in their careers and the stresses? Because yeah. you left one and jumped in all in there. Yeah. Some can't um, do that. They can't be on five <laughs> boards, but they aren't a few. What's the well and and you know, and if you're an operating executive, you wouldn't be on on five boards, right? Yeah. You would be on one or two. Um, and so I spend a lot of time now bringing along the next wave of 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 women and and helping them both in their career, uh, but also um, to get a seat at the table on a board. And I, I'm very vocal about telling people not to do it the way I do it. There's no reason for it to be sequential. Um, you can, you know, I thought I was so busy and was traveling all the time. And yes, all of that was true, but, uh, and maybe I should say, you, you know, you can still fit in a board. Um, and so, and what I see now is that your learnings are so exponential um, with outside perspective that I, I believe I would have been an even better operating executive had I done it earlier. I know I would have been an even better operating executive had I done it earlier. And so my advice is don't do it the way I did it. it you know, it's worked out fine for me. But um, hindsight's twenty twenty. I you can would go back have, and do it. If you can go back and do a mulligan or a redo, what would you yeah. do? I would get on a board earlier. Full stop. <laughs> board? Yeah. Pl singular? Plural? Well, I, I really I don't think as an operating executive you can do um, you could do one, maybe two. Um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't go beyond that. And I think that's fine. Yeah, totally makes sense. Okay, I gotta ask you about your career. I know technical, um, you came in at that time in the market, I remember when I broke into the business, uh, very well male dominated, and then now now it's much better. When you went through the ranks mm -hmm. as a technical person, I know you had some blockers and, and definitely some, probably some people like, well, we, you know, we've seen that. How did you handle that? What were some of the key pivot points in your journey? And we've had a lot of women tell their stories here on theCUBE, candidly, like, hey, I was going to tell that professor, I'm going to sit in the front row, I'm going to, I'm getting two degrees, you know, I'm robotics and aerospace. So, and, but, but they were challenged, even with the aspiration to, to do tech. Um, I'm not saying that was something that you had, but like when you, have you had experiences like that that you overcome? What were those key points and how did you handle them and, and how does that help people today? Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, um, you know, and not discounting that obviously um, this has been a journey for women and there are a lot of things to overcome, both in the workforce and also just balancing life, honestly. Um, and, um, and they're all real. Um, there's also a story of incredible support. And, um, you know, I'm the type of person where um, if somebody blocked me or didn't like me, I tended to just, you know, <laughs> think it was think it was me and like work harder and and get around them. and um, and I'm sure that some of that was potentially, gender related, um, I didn't interpret it that way at the time. And um, and I was lucky to have amazing mentors, um, many, many, many of whom were men, um, you know, because they were in the positions of power. Um, and they made a huge difference on my career, huge. Um, and I also had amazing female mentors, Meg Whitman and Livermore at HPE, who you know well, um, so I had both, but you know, when I look back on the people who made a difference, there are as many men on the list as there are women. Yeah, and that's a learning that it's at, create those coalitions, not just one or the other. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Um, well, I got to ask you about the, you brought up the, the uh, pandemic. This has come up in some interviews this year, a little bit last year on the International Women's Day, but this year it's resonating. And I would never ask an interview, I saw an interview once where um, there was a, a host asked a woman, how do you balance it all? And I, and I was no, and it was just like, no one asked men that. And so it's like, but with remote work, it's come up now the word empathy around people knowing each other's personal situation. In other words, yeah. when remote work happened, everybody went home. So we all got a glimpse of the backdrop. You got 
you can see what their personal life is on Facebook. We were just commenting before we came on camera um, about that. So remote yeah. work really kind of opened up this personal side of everybody, men and women. Yeah. So I think this brings this new uh, yeah. empathy kind of vibe or authentic cell, people call it. Is remote work an opportunity or a threat for advancement in women in tech? Um, it's a much debated topic. Um, I, I look at it as an opportunity for many of the reasons that you just said. Um, first of all, let me say that when I was an operating executive and would try to create an environment on my team that was family supportive, um, I would do that equally for young or you know early to mid career women as I did for early to mid career men. And the reason is, um, I needed those those men. You know, chances are they had a working spouse at home, right? Uh, I needed them to be able to share the load. Um, it's it's just as important to the women that that companies give you know the partner male or female, the partner support and the ability to share the load, right? So to me, it's it's not just a woman thing, it's it's women and men. And I always tried to create the environment where it was okay to go to your soccer game. I knew you would be online later in the evening when the kids were in bed and that was fine. And I think the pandemic has democratized that. Um, <laughs> And and made that um, you know made that yeah. kind of an everyday occurrence. The baby um, walks in during the Zoom call. The dog comes in. The leaf yeah. blower going on the outside the window. I've I've seen it all. On the doing yeah, the and interview. people don't try to pretend anymore that like you know the house is clean. The dogs behaved. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just it's just yeah. real and it's authentic. And I think that's healthy. Yeah. Um, I do. You know, I also love. I also love the office. Um, and, you know, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a 31 year old and a soon to be 27 year old daughter, uh, two daughters. Um, and, um, you know, they love going into the office. And I, and I think about when I was their age, how just charged up I would get from being in the office. Um, I also see how great it is for them to have a couple of days a week at home um, because you can, get a few things done in between Zoom calls that you don't have to end up piling on to the weekend. And, um, you know, so I think it's a really healthy, I think it's a really healthy mix now. Um, most tech companies are not mandating five days in. Um, most tech companies are at two to three days in. Um, I think that's a, I think that's a really good combination. It's interesting how people are, are changing their culture. Um, to get together more as groups and even events. I mean, while I got you, you might as well ask you, what's the board conversations around, you know, the old conferences, that, you know, before the pandemic, every company had like a user conference, right? Now yeah. it's like, well, do we really need to have that? I mean, we'll do smaller yeah. and we'll do digital. How, have you seen how companies are handling the in-person? Because this is where the relationships and the and are really formed yeah. in the face-to-face. -face. But not everyone's going to be going by now. So it's clearly back to face to face. We're seeing that with the cube, as you know. Yeah, but yeah. The numbers aren't it's, coming back, and the numbers aren't that high. But the stakeholders yeah. and the numbers are actually higher if you count digital. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you know, also on digital, um, there's fatigue from a hundred percent digital. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's a hybrid. Um, people don't want to be a hundred percent digital anymore. Uh, but they also don't want to go back to the days when everybody got on a plane for every every meeting, every call, every sales call. Um, you know, I'm seeing a mix on uh, user conferences. I would say two thirds of my companies are back, but not at the expense level that they were um, on user conferences. Um, we spent a lot of time getting updates on, because nobody has put, interestingly enough, nobody has put t and &E, travel and expense, back to pre-pandemic levels, nobody. Um, so everybody's pulled back on number of trips. Um, you know, marketing events are being very scrutinized, but I think very effective. They're, we're doing a lot of, yeah. and you know, these were part of the old model as well, that, like some things, some things just recycle. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of CIO um, and, and customer roundtables uh, in regional cities. Um, you know, those are 
quite effective right now because people want some face to face, but they don't necessarily want to get on a plane and go to Las Vegas in order to do it. I mean, some of them are, you know, there are a lot of things back in Las Vegas. Um, I mean, think about the meetings that when you were an operating executive, yeah, you go to the sales kickoff, you got to go to this, you got to go to that. There were mandatory face-to-faces that you had to go to, but there was a lot of travel that you probably could have done on Zoom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I then mean, the productivity to the family impact too. Again, think about, again, we're talking about the, the, the family yeah, and people's personal yes. lives, right? So, you know, got to meet a yeah. customer. All right, salesperson wants you to get in front of a customer. Got to fly to New York, take a red eye, come on back. Like, I mean, that's gone. Yeah, and oh, by the way, the customer doesn't necessarily want to be in the office that day. So, uh, you know, they may or may not be happy about that. So again, it's, 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 it's and not or, right? It's a mix. Um, and I think it's great to see people back to some face-to-face. It's great to see marketing and events back to some face-to-face. It's also great to see that it hasn't gone back to the level it was. I think that's a really healthy dynamic. Well, I'll tell you that from our experience, while we're on the top, we'll move back to back to the International Women's Day, is that the productivity of digital, this program we're doing is going to be streamed. We couldn't do this face-to-face because we had everyone fly the, into an event. Yeah. We're going to do hundreds of stories that we couldn't have done. We're doing it remote. Because yeah. it's better to get the yeah. content than not have it. I mean, it's offline. So, yeah. but, it, but it's not about getting people to the event and watch the screen for seven hours. It's pick your interview and then engage. So yeah. it's self-service. So we're seeing a lot, the new user experience kind of direct to consumer. And so I think there would be an, I think there's going to be a digital first class citizen with events. So that, that matches up yeah. with the kind of experience, but the offline version, face-to-face yeah. optimized for relationships. And, and that's yeah. where the recruiting gets done. That's where, you know, people can build these relationships with, with each other. Yeah, and it can be asynchronous. I think that's a that's a real value proposition. It's, it's a great point. Okay, I want to get I, I want to get into the uh, technology side of the of uh, education and reskilling and those things. I remember in the '80s, computer science was software engineering. You learned like nine languages. You took some double E <laughs> courses, one or two, and all the other kind of gut classes in school. Engineering, you had the four class disciplines, and some offshoots of specialization. Now it's it's incredible the diversity yeah. of tracks in all engineering programs and computer science and yeah. and outside of those those departments. Yeah. Can you speak to the importance of the STEM and the diversity in the technology industry and how this brings opportunity to lower the bar to get in and how people can stay in and grow and keep leveling up? Yeah. Well, um, look, we're we're constantly working on how to. Um, how to help the incoming funnel, but then, you know, at a, at a, at a university level, I'm on the foundation board of Kansas state where I got my engineering degree. Um, I was also chairman of the national action council for minorities and engineering, which was all about diversity in STEM and how do you keep that pipeline going? Because honestly, the U S needs more tech resources than we have Um, And if you don't tap into the diversity of our entire workforce, we won't be able to fill that need. Um, And so we focus a lot on um, both the funnel, right, that starts the middle school level, particularly for girls, getting them in, you know, the situation of hands-on comfort level with coding, with robot building, you know, whatever gives them that confidence. Um, And then keeping that going all the way into, um, you know, university program and making sure that they don't attrit out, right? And so there's a number of initiatives, whether it's mentoring and support groups and financial aid uh, to make sure that underrepresented minorities, women and other minorities, um, you know, get through the funnel and stay, you know, stay in. Got it. Now, let me ask you, you have said, I have two daughters, you have, you have a family of, of girls too. Is there a vibe difference between the new generation and what's the trends that you're seeing in the, this next early wave? I mean, not as slow as, maybe, I don't have it as in the middle school, but like as people start getting into their adult lives, college and beyond, is, what's the current point of view, posture, makeup of the talent coming in yeah. Um, the yeah. Certain orientations. Do you see any patterns? What's your observation? Yeah. 
Um, it's interesting. Um, so if I look at electrical engineering, my my major, it's um, and if I look at Kansas State, which spends a lot of time on this, uh, and I think does a great job, but the the diversity of that as a major has not changed dramatically since I was there in the early 80s. Um, where it has changed very significantly is computer science. There are many, many university and college programs around the country where, uh, you know, it's 50-50 in computer science from a gender mixed perspective, which is huge progress, huge progress. And so, and to me, that's, you know, I think CS is a fantastic uh, degree for tech. Uh, regardless of what function you actually end up doing in these companies. I mean, I was an electrical engineer. I I never I never did core electrical engineering work. I went right into sales and marketing and general management roles. Um, so I think I think a bunch of you know diverse CS graduates is a really, really good sign. And you know, we need to we need to continue to push on that, but but progress has been made. I think the, you know, kind of goes back to the thing we were just talking about, which is the um, attrition of those, let's just talk about women, right? The attrition of those women, um, once they got past early career and into mid-career, then was a concern, right? And that goes back to, um, you know, just the inability to, um, you know, get it all done. Um, and that I I am hopeful is going to be better served now. Right, well, so it's great to have you on. I know you're super busy. I appreciate you taking the time and contributing to our program on corporate board membership and, and some of your story and observations and opinions and analysis. Always great to have you and call you That's contributor great. for theCUBE. Uh, you can jump on one more board, be one of our board contributors for our, our anal <laughs> analyst tech I, I'm collective. I'm at capacity. <laughs> <laughs> final, final word. What's the big seat at the table issue that, that's going well? and areas that need to be improved? Um, so I'll, I'll speak for my boards because they have made great progress in efficiency. Um, you know, obviously with interest rates uh, going up um, and the mix between growth and profitability changing in terms of what investors are looking for, many, many companies have had to do a hard pivot from grow at all costs to a healthy balance of growth and profit. Um, and I'm very pleased with how my companies uh, have made that pivot. And I think that is going to make much better companies as a result. Um, I think diversity is something that has not been solved at the corporate level and we need to keep working it. Awesome, so thank you for coming on theCUBE. CUBE alumni, now contributor on multiple boards, mm -hmm. full-time job, Love the, uh, love the new challenge and chapter you're on, so we'll be following in. We'll check in for more updates and thank you for being a contributor on this program uh, this year and this episode. We're going to be doing more of these quarterly, so we're going to move beyond That's once great. a year. So well, thank it's you for It's always good to see you, John. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Talk to you later. This is, this is the Cube coverage of IWD, National Women's Day 2023. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.